So the topic I will be speaking on is how to improve long-term diabetes outcome. And my focus will be on the class of patients we deal with. Basically, I'm a pediatrician, so I look after children and adolescents. And the majority of our patients are belonging to the middle class, some to the upper middle class, and many to the lower class. Parents have very little time. In many instances, the parents are both working. So in this category of patients, how do you improve the long-term diabetes outcome? Now, what we would desire is that every patient should receive appropriate uninterrupted treatment with financial assistance if needed, which we provide at the Juvenile Diabetes Foundation. Every child with diabetes should grow mature normally and should remain free from long-term micro and macrovascular complications as long as possible and enjoy a near normal life expectancy. What is very important also is that there should be no diabetes distress, depression, disordered eating, anxiety, which are known to be commonly associated with pediatric onset diabetes, comorbidities, especially thyroid and celiac disease, should be detected early, treated early. Every patient should be educated in type 1 diabetes self-management. The education should be ongoing and we should ensure that the child grows up to have a successful career and successful married life. How do you prevent or how do you delay the long-term micro and macrovascular complications and therefore hope for a better life expectancy? There are two important things. The HbA1c should be as close to normal as possible. The current recommendation for the pediatric age group is below 7% with minimum glycemic variability. At least 70% of the sugar values should be in the range with less than 5% below 70 and less than 1% below 54. But now we know, unlike in the past, that it's not only severe hypoglycemia which can affect the developing brain. Even hyperglycemia plays an equally important role. So the stress is not just on preventing hypoglycemia, but also preventing hyperglycemia. There are three important pillars, the insulin replacement therapy, medical nutritional therapy, therapeutic monitoring, but very, very important. And none of these pillars can succeed unless there is ongoing comprehensive education and even more important, psycho psychosocial guidance and assistance. Coming to insulin replacement therapy, presently for all our patients, we use a basal bolus insulin regime. The basal insulin is given to regulate hepatic glucose output in fasting state and to suppress ketogenesis. The bolus given preprandial covers each meal or snack. NPH insulin, which was very commonly used in the past, was not an ideal basal insulin and hence now we have better long-acting analogs. NPH did not cover 24 hours. It had a distinct peak, which is not what you want in a basal insulin. As a result, children had to snack in the evening during the peak of NPH action and they were at risk of hypoglycemia in the night. There's tremendous day-to-day -day variability of absorption in the same patient from day-to-day and part of it is because NPH requires very careful resuspension. But NPH does have two advantages. The most important is the cost. It is far, far, far cheaper than any of the analogs, which is why at times we still have to use it. And the other advantage, if one can call it so, is in a poor patient, it can be mixed in a syringe with either regular insulin or a rapid acting analog. Uh, in, when in the 2000s, we had insulin detemia and glargine coming up. They had a much lesser peak as compared to NPH and they worked for nearly 24 hours. The most common basal insulin we use today in our patients is glargine. In 80%, you need it only once a day. In 20%, we may have to give it twice a day. Detemia, 50 to 70% do need it twice a day. In patients who need glargine twice a day, and cannot, cannot, or rather who can afford a more costlier analog, we may use Degludec or the recently approved Glargene U300. 
Well, if NPH was not the ideal basal insulin, regular human insulin is not an ideal bolus insulin. As you can see here, if you compare the physiological insulin response to meal with the time action profile of human regular insulin, there are three disadvantages. One, slower onset. That means you have to inject 20 to 30 minutes or more before eating, which in children is a big disadvantage, particularly in the shop short lunch break they have in school, a lower peak, which means that it's less efficient in controlling post-meal glycemia, and a prolonged duration of action, which means that after the meal, glycemia has been controlled, the action still continues, and therefore the child may have to eat a snack in between the two major meals to prevent hypoglycemia, and this can lead to excess weight gain. So therefore, in patients who can afford, we prefer the rapid-acting analogs, this pro, aspart, etc., which can be given 10-15 minutes before eating and which cover the meal appropriately and which have a shorter duration of action, so there is no need really for between-meal snacking. Of late, FIAS, I have found very useful because it can be injected soon before eating and in fact, there is data to show that even if you inject it after eating, the results are not bad. And in India, FIAS happens to be even cheaper than ASPART. Now, the ideal insulin regime in a patient using MDI would be a basal bolus regime where the patient takes a rapid acting analog before breakfast, before lunch, before dinner and glargine once a day. Now, if this patient wishes to have a snack between meals, then either the snack would have to be low carb or the patient would have to take an additional dose of rapid acting analog or use human regular insulin. The basal dose, we ask the patient to adjust in such a way that the blood glucose is maintained in the target range overnight and before breakfast and also before each meal. The bolus dose is calculated based on the carb content of the meal. For this, the patient has to learn carb counting and know his insulin carb ratio, which in children we calculate as 500 divided by the total daily dose, in toddlers 300 divided by the total daily dose, and then fine tune the ICR by comparing the two hours post-meal blood glucose with the pre-meal blood glucose when the patient takes a meal of known carb content with low fat and protein. Ideally, it should be 20, 30, or 40 above the premium. Some patients may also add extra insulin for a meal with high protein or fat. For every 100 kilocalories of fat or protein, you may need the same amount of insulin that you would require for 10 grams of carb. Having calculated the insulin dose based on the carb content of the meal, then you add a correction dose if the pre-meal blood glucose is above your target. For this, you use the insulin sensitivity factor, which is 1800 or 1500, depending upon whether you're using a rapid acting analog or regular insulin, divided by your total daily dose. And then you may subtract the active insulin. If you have given a bolus in the last four hours, assuming that 25% would be used per hour. And therefore, at the end of say three hours, 25% would still be remaining. If there is activity planned within 90 minutes post-meal using analog, you may reduce the calculated bolus accordingly. Now, MDI compared to the insulin pump therapy. The pump offers several advantages. What are these advantages? With regard to bolus insulin, you can give multiple doses with one painless prick once in three days. You can give precise small doses. This is very, very important in children. In a child taking three units, if I increase the dose by one unit, which is what the pen allows me to do, except for one pen, which allows half unit, that's a huge percentage increase in dose. With the pump, I can make fractional increases in dosages. I can also deliver the bolus over different periods of time, depending upon the glycemic index of the food, the manner in which I eat, and the fat content of the meal. And if the child, after taking the insulin, does not eat, then the bolus can be suspended midway. 
when it comes to basal insulin the pump also offers many advantages over mdi since it uses only a rapid analog for basal which is released in small pulses there is no subcutaneous depot and hence course correction during the course of the day is possible so the the basal can also be suspended it can be reduced for exercise hypoglycemia it can be raised on sick days we can set multiple basal rates to the day which allows us to take care of the dawn phenomenon and you can have different patterns for different days of the week and most important it can be linked to cgm and pumps can have a low glucose suspend a predictive low glucose suspend which can prevent hypoglycemia or delay the time you spend in hypoglycemia and with the 780g now automatic basal delivery is also possible but not all patients in our scenario can afford the pump the pump would be for those who can afford the additional expense but i think this is not the most important criteria more important is patient should be comfortable wearing the pump the patient should be motivated and willing to put in effort patient should be intelligent enough to learn the finer details of pump management and very 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 important patient should receive intensive education in pump management and of course have a 24 hour backup facility now when cost is a concern or when the patient prefers carb containing snacks between the meals but will not take additional doses of rapid acting analog then we put the patient on human regular insulin giving it before breakfast before lunch before dinner to cover the meal main meal and a mid meal snack and when an afternoon pre lunch shot is not possible and let me tell you this is pretty common in our situation because many schools refuse to allow the child to take insulin in the school or refuse to even supervise the insulin administration in such cases we can give them a rapid acting analog with nph in the morning the analog would cover the breakfast the nph would cover the lunch and the snack the child takes in school and again pre dinner rapid acting analog with glargine at that time and for the patient who cannot afford analogs at all then we use the basal bolus regime with nph and regular insulin the regular insulin as in the previous instance covers breakfast lunch dinner and the snack following each of these meals and a small dose of nph is given before breakfast to fill the gaps between the dosages of regular insulin and a larger dose is given at night but there is always a risk of nighttime hypoglycemia very very few patients are still on conventional insulin regime which was used prior to the dcct where two injections a day were given each being a mix of regular and nph this we use only for those patients who just cannot and will not take an afternoon injection and there is resource constraint coming to medical nutritional therapy there are two arms one is healthy eating and the other is matching insulin with food so point number one healthy eating healthy in the sense the quantity should be correct so how do you judge that by monitoring the weight gain if the weight gain is good the child is eating the right amount and the quality should be good in our scenario the problem is with the glycemic index of the food so they need advice how to improve the glycemic index how to improve and increase the protein content of the food lower the salt content have healthy fats in the right amount and maintain adequate fiber content no junk food should be kept in the house sweeteners and diabetic foods have no role and because this is healthy eating the entire family should eat the same meals not keeping junk food in the house is very important because having it there and telling the child not to eat it never works only children who are obese hypertensive have microalbuminuria or celiac disease may need a special diet and when it comes to matching insulin with carbs which is very very important either we use carb exchanges or we use carb counting depending on the patient's ability to learn and depending on the insulin regime so in carb exchanges the patient is taught to exchange within the same group in the stated amount after being given a sample diet based on their preference and the carb 
type and content of a given meal from day to day is fixed. So this gives limited flexibility. But at the same time, monotony is avoided by using exchange system. And in carb counting, I think everybody knows this, the patient learns the carb content of commonly consumed foods, right? And can eat whatever healthy item he likes at any time by just knowing the carb content of what he's eating and knowing his insulin carb ratio, thus giving considerable flexibility. Coming to therapeutic monitoring, uh, this is at home very important for the patient to do so that the insulin dose can be fine-tuned. We normally start with 0.7 to 1 unit per kg per day. We give a higher dose after recovery from DKA, a higher dose during puberty, and we warn the patient that the dose would go down considerably in the honeymoon phase. The bolus to basal ratio is um, 50 to 70, 50 or 70 to 50 or 30. And this depends on whether you're using the analogs or whether you're using uh, human insulin. And fine tuning is done by doing SMBG and many patients do CGM now, fortunately. So in SMBG, it has to be done at least six to 10 times a day. Unfortunately, many people do it, but they don't do the rest of it. That is recording, analyzing and acting on the results. And which is why we ask them to stay in constant touch with us. The basal insulin controls the overnight blood glucose and the premium blood glucose. And the bolus insulin, if it is the analog, controls the two to three hours post meal blood glucose, while regular, if you use regular insulin, also contributes to control of the next pre meal blood glucose. The target given to the patients is the simplified target of 70 to 180 at any time, or more specifically, 70 or 80 to 130 or 140 pre meal and 100 to 180 post meal. And those adjustments are based on blood glucose pattern when the child is eating a fixed carb meal plan. CGM, we have three varieties available here. The implantable sensor available abroad is not yet available here, right? And many patients are using CGM. The professional variant is also useful as an educational tool or especially in children where we don't know what's happening overnight, what's happening in school. Because many a times, hypoglycemia, hyperglycemia would be totally asymptomatic. So it is pretty useful even for those patients who do not use the real-time or the intermittently scanned CGM. For those who use these, of course, it's much better and they can have better control. There are studies which have shown that using the CGM right at the onset of diabetes leads to much better long-term control. Coming to clinic monitoring, patients must attend the clinic every three months and at every visit, we review the symptoms. Most of the times they are asymptomatic, but then checking the SMBG records would help. The injection technique, blood sugar technique is checked. We revise the hypo and sick day guidelines with them. Very important, we chart the growth, which gives a lot of information, not only about the control, but even about onset of celiac, thyroid disorder, etc. The BP, we look for a goiter, liver, and lipohypertrophy. Extremely important because lipohypertrophy commonly develops in children as children resist injections and therefore parents do not do systematic site rotation. HbA1c once in three months, annually after two to five years of diabetes, and when the child is above 11 years, we check the urine for microalbumin, I for dilated fundus examination for diabetic retinopathy, and a comprehensive foot examination. So annually, we look for evidence of early microvascular complications at a stage where they are reversible. Once in two years or when symptomatic, we do thyroid function tests. More often, if the patient has antibodies positive and a celiac screen. Every three years, if lipids are normal, we repeat the serum lipids after 11 years of age. And if there are symptoms that are suggestive of other comorbidities, we may look for adrenal, gastric, parietal antibodies and for autoimmune hepatitis. Most important, meeting the mental health team. If there is a suggestion that the patient is finding it hard to manage diabetes, worries a lot about various aspects of diabetes, worries a lot about the future, their own future or the long-term complications, doesn't sleep well regularly at night, generally feels unwell, there are frequent conflicts in the family over diabetes, 
the child or adolescent is embarrassed about having diabetes, cannot reveal to others. They feel hopeless. They feel like a failure. They feel life is worthless. No interest in things. Cannot concentrate. Or they are overeating or gaining a lot of weight. Or there is frequent school absenteeism. Or they have been hospitalized more than one for DKA. They must meet the mental health team. And there are a lot of good questionnaires available to look for depression, to look for eating disorders, anxiety, the quality of life in children with diabetes and in their parents. Lastly, a visit to the diabetes clinic or even management of childhood diabetes is not just about meeting a doctor. It's about the nutritionist. It's about the mental health team. It's about the educator. It's about the social worker. Very, very important. It's about meeting seniors who have been successful and who can act as excellent role models and guides. And of course, most important for supplies for patients who cannot afford. Thank you.